Designed to capitalize upon Beatlemania, A Hard Day's Night was conceived, designed, shot, and premiered within the span of only about six months. The shooting schedule alone was only seven weeks. It was the second of two proposed movie ideas, the first one being entitled something like The Yellow Teddy Bears, which was rejected by the band because, besides having the proposed format of using the band as a background act instead of being the main characters, the producers didn't intend to use Beatles music. That factor alone eliminated the proposal. Then came an offer from United Artists. And now, probably known only to hardcore Beatles fans, are 10 things that you didn't know about the movie A Hard Day's Night. Number 10. The poker game scene on the train wasn't shot on a train. The interior of a van at Twickenham Film Studios in London on the 11th of March 1964 served as the set for the poker game scene, which included a surreal miming of I Should Have Known Better. The van was stationary, being rocked about by members of the film crew to mimic the movements of a train. Number 9. The press conference scene, as shot, wasn't part of the original script. On a day that had been planned for an exterior shoot, there were so many fans blocking traffic that Dick Lester had to quickly improvise the press conference scene so that shooting could continue on an interior closed set. The participants were real reporters and photographers that had assembled in hopes of interviewing the guys. The absurd questions in the scene were suggested by the irritation that the guys felt from constantly answering such questions in real life. Number 8. A script to capture the essence of being a beetle. The plot was derived from observations made by writer Alan Owen as he followed the band on a real gig. One of the main facets of the script was defining distinct personalities of the band members who, at this point, were known mostly only through quips at press conferences. Along with farming ideas for scenes in the movie, Owen also strived by emphasis of natural personality traits of each of the band members to design characters that would support a storyline. Another observation of Owen was that the guys were being confined by their success. Due to their immense popularity, they couldn't be seen in public without causing a near riot. Focusing on this aspect, director Dick Lester designed the movie to have the guys appear in very small places throughout the first half of the film and on constant guard to elude capture by fans. This idea was also punctuated by a scripted announcement by Wilfred Bramble as Grandfather John McCartney saying, I thought I was supposed to be getting a change of scenery, and so far I've been in a train and a room, and a car and a room, and a room and a room. Well, maybe that's all right for a bunch of powder geegaws like you lot, but I'm feeling decidedly straight-jacketed. This confinement theme leads to a climax scene of escape to the open field and open spaces later in the film. Number seven. The acceleration of the guy's activity during the open field breakout scene was due to a technical necessity. The first of the breakout scenes were done from the helicopter. When the helicopter arrived on the set, Dick Lester asked the cameraman if he would go up in the copter and get some aerial shots of the guys. There was a crunch for time available to do this, and the only battery the cameraman had was low on power. He decided that rather than miss the opportunity, he would set the camera to use less power and so be able to get the shots using a faulty battery. To accomplish the lower current consumption, he ran the film at a slower frame speed. The aerial shoot was successful, but the slower frame rate in the camera caused the action in the scene to be faster than normal when projected at normal speed. This was initially perceived by Dick Lester viewing the Daily Rushes as an artistic move on the part of the cinematographer. When he was told that it was a technical flaw, he still liked it, and the scene remains as is in the final cut. As a result, a decision was made to shoot the remainder of the shots over the next few days for the breakout scene at the same slower frame rate. 
Incidentally, John Lennon was not present on the initial shoot of those scenes as he was away promoting his book in his own right. A double performed with the other three guys in long shots. Close-ups using John were filmed later and spliced in. Number six. Some of the first day's shooting was lost because of fan frenzy. According to Dick Lester, frenzied fans at the train station at the end of the first day's shooting thought that a film crew member who happened to be carrying the film negatives from the first day and who happened to have a hairstyle like a beetle was a beetle and began chasing him. Fearing bodily harm, he panicked and ran away from them, dropping some of the film cans in the process. A few of the cans popped open, ruining in a few seconds all of the contained scenes. Dick Lester said that it did get better after that day. Number five. The word Beatles isn't spoken anywhere in the movie. This is one that you may have noticed. With a touch of implied common knowledge, Beatles is represented only in print. On Ringo's bass drum in the studio scenes, the banner behind the group when they're doing the concert scenes and on the side of the helicopter on the getaway scene at the end of the movie. Number four. Different countries, different titles. In order to culturally translate the theme of the film, it was titled differently in some countries. Some examples are All for One in Italy, Yeah, Yeah, Yeah in Germany, and Four Boys in the Wind in France. Number three. They had to join the Actors' Union. The protocol detail of the guys having to be members of Equity, the British Actors Union, in order to appear as paid actors in a film, had to be accomplished on the set, as no provision had been made to do so during the frenetic pre-production period. A brief induction ensued, with Wilfred Bramble proposing their membership and Norman Rosington seconding the motion. Number 2. Ringo wasn't acting during the Riverwalk scenes. Critics responded positively to Ringo's portrayal of a morose, rejected, lonely soul walking along a river and randomly trying to entertain himself after the scene of his talk with Paul's grandfather. In fact, the scenes where Ringo wandered aimlessly about in his raincoat resulted at his suggestion to the director in place of any planned action because on that morning he was seriously hung over after an evening of partying and he wasn't acting. He really did feel like crap. And now, number one. United Artists had no expectation of making a profit on the film and didn't care. UA had discovered late in 1963 that EMI's contract with the Beatles did not cover film soundtracks. A plan was hatched to propose a three-movie deal to the group with the expectation that B-grade movies would be distributed merely to serve as promotional vehicles for the songs in the soundtrack, which UA would then be able to legally market under their own record label, independent of the standing contract that the Beatles had with EMI. It was solely from the record sales that UA expected to make a huge profit. By 1971, that little film, made with a skimpy $500,000 budget, was estimated to have earned $11 million worldwide, equivalent in 2022 dollars to over $79 million. In spite of its hectic schedule and the initial tepid response from United Artists executives, a Hard Day's Night remains today as a shining classic example of quasi-documentary films. It's one of those that, for many people who first saw it, marks a time for which they pretty much remember everything that happened on that day, before, and after they saw the movie. It also demonstrated the amazing ability of John Lennon and Paul McCartney to write songs rapidly and for the group to record them in short order on a tight schedule and still have outstanding production quality. Their next two movies done under the United Artists contract, Help and Yellow Submarine, didn't come close to the same magical aura that sprang from the first movie, rapidly produced to capitalize on the moment when Beatlemania was taking over the world. Hey, thanks for watching this video, and I hope you enjoyed it. 
If you did, please click on that like button, won't you? And leave me a comment. Let me know what you think. If you're not yet a subscriber, this would be a great time to subscribe to the channel. And if you are already a subscriber, this is a great time to consider upgrading your subscription to channel member status and enjoy channel member perks like being the first to see new videos days before anyone in the general public sees them. Thanks again for watching.